So we're, we're, we're starting in our disciple making with establishing people, not only in who God is and what he's done, but now who they are in Christ. And so if, I, if you're thinking, through, I'm like, what should be imperative in discipleship? Well, certainly who God is and what he's done in Jesus Christ. We've got to get the gospel down. We've got to get who God is. We've got to understand those things when we're making disciples. If they don't know who God is in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ, then we're not making disciples of Jesus. But if they also don't know who they are as a new creation, Paul says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Our baptism is our being established in our new identity. It's our way of saying, you, you had a, this is who you used to be, this is who you are. Uh, you are baptized into the name of Father. Into the name of the Father. So what is Jesus saying when he's saying that? He's, he, if God is Father, and what has he done? He is, he's the perfect Son who came and lived on our behalf, obeying God in everything like we don't. What is that? Oh, uh, Dying on our behalf, taking on our rebellion, because by nature we were children of wrath, Ephesians 2. That's who we were. Okay? But God, who's rich in mercy, changed that through Jesus Christ. So the perfect Son of God goes to the cross, and he who knew no sin became sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The perfect Son is giving his life so that we might be treated as perfect children. Okay, so who are we if our faith is in Jesus, that one obeyed perfectly on our behalf, that one died in our stead, that one rose again so that we might be given a new name, that we might truly become children of God. Remember Jesus prays in John 17, Father, I pray that you would love them in the same way in which you love me. That's amazing. You ever thought about the fact that God, if you are in Christ, loves you, exactly like he loves the Son. That's incredible. That's perfect love. You're not lacking in any love whatsoever. The question is, do you know that? Do you believe that? Is the Spirit reminding you of that? You know, my dear sister once again said, I, I believe that you, you, when you do that process, right, you pray, right? And, and you encourage them to go and pray. And I love that about you. you keep, and, and the reason why that's so important is because Nobody can give you this. I can't, I can't say it and you get it. The Spirit of God has to bring it to your heart. And, and that's why we pray. We pray because it's communion with God. It's, it's growing in our intimacy so He gets to speak to us. By the way, let me just encourage you. Prayer, I think, needs to shift from us talking a lot to us talking less. And us listening to God. Letting Him speak to us. He's speaking. He wants to speak to you by His Spirit. I, I, I'm all for us talking to Him. But it's interesting that Jesus seems to, to listen a lot more than he talks to the Father. And once in a while, he, you hear him, he goes, he talks out loud, and you, know, and you hear this, you remember on the way to Lazarus' tomb, and he says, I'm doing this now so they'll know. And he's kind of letting us into his, his intimacy with the Father. But it's interesting that Jesus also said, I do nothing but what the Father tells me to do. And so we know he's just always listening, and he's taking his orders, and he's communing all the time. When Paul says pray without ceasing, he's talking about that ongoing intimacy with, with God through his spirit. And I, I think we aren't, we, if we were to grow, if anything, I'd say let's grow in our spirit dependency. And so I, I'm glad you brought that up because I just assume that and that's not good to assume uh, that we're doing all of this in prayer and that we're doing all this in, in spirit dependency and that we're leading people to go wait on the Lord and we're leading them to listen. And that's what had to happen with Randy. So he had to Go and be with the Lord in prayer, and the Spirit of God met him in that place. So uh, I want to encourage you, if you're a church planter, you're in leadership, it, you're, we all need to grow in our, our life waiting on the Lord in prayer. Uh, this, this, is, this gets, prayer is our, our, our means by which we get to do all of this. Uh, that's why Jesus tells them to go and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit, and they wait in prayer, and the Spirit falls on them. So I don't want to assume that, so I'm thankful that you, it's a good part of the body. Thank you for being here. And so, don't miss this, though. If God's our Father and we're loved, 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 just like Jesus the Son, what are we? We're beloved. You know, we, we are the family of God. We're adopted, into, which means God actually wants you. Now, that when you think of adoption, 
It's interesting because the Bible says you're both adopted and born again. So you're both. You both have the DNA of Jesus in you because you're born by His Spirit. So you, you, have, you have it all. That's what's amazing. You're not lacking. You have it all. You have this, the Spirit gave you birth, which means you are truly a child of God, which means you have the DNA of Jesus. That's incredible. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's incredible. But you also have been chosen. You're adopted. So it's not that God just goes, oh, I guess I have to have you. You know, He wants you. He wants you. He, he pursued you. He paid for you with his own life. That's how much he loves you. And when you know that you're loved like that, what do you do? You love one another. Jesus said in John 13, after he washed his disciples' feet, I've set an example for you. What I've done to you, you also do unto others. This is a new commandment I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you shall love one another. This is how all will know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. If you're going to say, like, how do we know you're a disciple? Do you know the love of God? Romans 8, Paul says that he, he gives you his spirit. If you don't have the spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Christ. That's an interesting statement. When's the last time you sat down with someone and said, do you have the spirit of Christ? You know, they're struggling with their, their understanding. Am I really a child of God? Am I really saved? What do we usually do? Did you pray a prayer when you were eight? Wrote it in the cover of your Bible? I don't know if they do that here, but I know the, the, a lot of that was, that's what I was brought up with was, you know, remember when you went forward and you prayed that prayer and you wrote the date in? Remember we put it in the cover of your Bible? It's right there. See, you did it. You're fine. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't feel fine, you know? And that's not what I needed. When Paul shows up in Ephesus, he doesn't say, did you guys pray a prayer? He didn't say, did you ask Jesus into your heart? There was none of that. He said, have you received the Holy Spirit? We had no idea there was such a thing. He says, well, then he preaches the gospel to them. And the Spirit fills them. And now he knows they belong. What's the evidence that you belong to God? You have his Spirit. Romans 8, you can now call him Daddy, Abba. So please don't, don't be quick to give people assurance of their salvation if they don't know him. If they don't, if they don't have any evidence, they don't have the Spirit testifying that they're loved. Like, go back and preach the gospel again. Continue to remind them that, it, that they, need, they need to know the Father loves them through the Son. And keep preaching the gospel with the power of the Spirit, asking the Spirit of God to finally show their hearts that they're dearly loved children. And if they don't get that, let's stop. Let's not move on to a whole bunch of other things until they understand they're dearly loved. Jesus does not begin his ministry life without him hearing, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Then he goes out into ministry. So let's not call people to go do things for God because the problem is if they don't know their love without doing things, they're going to think they do things to get loved. That's what's going to happen. And then they feel more loved when they do more, and when they fail, they're going to feel less loved. But they aren't loved because they do good things. They're loved because God loves them through the Son who did all the good stuff, who was loved before he did any of the good stuff. That's what's really amazing about Jesus, is the Father loved the Son before he did any ministry. That's the love we get. Love without merit. Love without need to perform. Love without needing to measure up. It's just love because God has chosen to love you. And if you get that, then you can love others. But if you don't get that, then you'll love others only because they love you. And remember, Jesus says, what different are you than the world? They do all do that. Everybody loves somebody to be loved, but I call you to love your enemies. But you can't love your enemies unless you know you were an enemy, loved by God. Because you'll always go like, well, they don't deserve it. Because you think you deserve God's love. But you don't deserve God's love. You deserve God's wrath. When my kids are complaining, you know, and we, a lot of times you know, you're in the car and they're complaining about getting the seat they didn't want and, or someone's bumping them or, you know, they're not sharing their candy well or whatever. And uh, at times I'll stop and even pull over and I'll say, hey, guys, before we go any further, let, let, let's just ask this question. What do you deserve? And they'll say, death. <laughs> That's true, right? The wages of sin is? death. And I remind them of that. I said, what did you get? And they say, life. I say, yeah, what else? Life eternal. Yeah, what else? God's love. Yeah, and we, we rehearse what we have. And what we deserve was death, but what we got was life. We, what we deserve was rejection. What we got was acceptance. What we deserve is, is God's hatred. What we got was God's love. Look at this. We are dearly loved children of God. So like when you're helping the church, you're know, like, hey, come on, guys, love your neighbors. 
well, what's wrong with you? You know, and you get frustrated and they're not doing it. And Well, what's wrong with them is they've forgotten who God is, what he's done, and who they are. And then when they realize that, when they realize the Good Samaritan story was done to them, that Jesus was along the way and he stopped and he paid for their brokenness and he brought them in and he made sure that they were made healthy and he, he was willing to pay at the cost of his own life. When they realized they were the neighbor that Jesus loved, then they can love the neighbor that's hard to love. But until they realize that, they won't. You know, I've been with a lot of people and they're like, well, I don't want to, I, I can't love them, they're jerks. You're the jerk. I was the jerk. I rebelled against the creator of the universe. I rebelled against the one who made me, who gives me life, who sustains me. And I said, you, God. That's what I did. I said, I don't want to follow you. I want to do my own way. I'm the jerk. And if I don't realize that's who I was apart from Christ, I won't be able to love those who are mean to me. See, if we think we are entitled to his love. You know, have, you ever, have you ever sat around and thought, God is really blessed to have me. <laughs> you don't really say it that way, but you do tend to go like, man, I don't know how he could love those people, you know, or, and, you, you, and we do this. We're self-righteous. We, we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. We're not sober-minded in our judgment of ourselves. And so what we tend to do then is we have a sense of entitlement that I deserved God's love. I'm a pretty good kid. He was picking the A-team when he picked me, you know? And that's not true. And so when I can realize that it's only by his grace that I have what I have, then I can be gracious to others. It's only unmerited love that I've received. Therefore, I can give love without needing to have anything paid back. I don't need people to thank me. I don't need people to be uh, grateful because I, I'm not, I mean, think about it. Do you, do you appropriately and sufficiently thank God for everything he's given you? Has he withheld his blessings because you're terrible at giving him thanks? No. He keeps pouring blessing in your life and you still don't give him the thanks he deserves. And neither do I. None of us do. And yet we have a gracious God who gives us good gifts, even though we fail to be gracious in our response at times to him. So that gives us the ability to love others. So then we ask the question, what if we were the church who knew the love of God, so we were a family, how would we love others in the place that God sent us? By the way, just, that, just helping people think through that will give them so much to think about. Like, hey, I know you're a small group. Has God put anybody in your life that needs the love of God? It needs to be loved like a family. You know, I... I remember when the Lord woke us up to this with Nikki, the lady who lives next door to us who is a, a widow, and at that point she's 15 years uh, in grieving her husband who died of cancer and had become a recluse and a hoarder. And, I mean, just her life was an absolute mess. And we tried to reach out to her for about two years, and she continued to reject us over and over and over and over again. And I remember when my wife one day comes home, and she's like, that's it, I washed my hands of that woman. And... Uh, and the, the, she should have started that way because I think what she was trying to do was change her yeah. instead of love her. And uh, in that moment, the Lord really impressed on our hearts, what if Nikki was your mother? What if she was a family member? How would you love her? And that's the beauty of the gospel is that's how Jesus loved us. He loved us even though we weren't family, like we were. So what if we loved our neighbors like that? What if we love the people God puts in our life like they're the lost children of God who don't know their Father loves them dearly and the only way they're going to come to know the Father's love for them is through us loving them like the Father loved us. That's how people are going to get to know the love of the Father, by the way. Jesus says that's how they'll know that, that you're my disciples by your love for one another. John 17, that's how the world's going to know that the Father sent the Son is by your unity and, and care for others. It's like that's how they're going to know. That's how they come to know. And so... Then we go, man, how would we do it? And in our case, it was, oh, we just, we're not going to give up on Nikki. We're going to keep loving her. And I remember the day when she knocked on our door, and uh, she, she was uh, having terrible, I wasn't there, but Janie t told me about it. She was having terrible chest pain. She needed to go to the hospital, but her van was broken down. And she didn't want to call the ambulance because she didn't want anybody to know she was in need. That, by the way, was the reason why she kept rejecting us, because she didn't want to be needy. She'd already given her heart to her husband, and he died. And so a human had already failed her once. Now, she speaks very highly of him, but he died. 
So the hard thing about putting your trust in humans is eventually they're going to die. I know that sounds morbid, but there's only one who's already died and risen again and has a resurrected body that's not going to die again, and that's Jesus. So uh, all of us get, you know, let down by humans, and she did too. In fact, he was a great guy, but he still wasn't Jesus. So she's left, and she doesn't want to entrust herself to anybody else again because it hurts. It's hard to have people let you down. But she couldn't help it now. She's going to die if she doesn't get someone to take her to the hospital, but she's too embarrassed to have anybody know that she needs help, so she won't call an ambulance. Isn't that crazy? Lots of us do that, though, don't we? We do everything we can to avoid being helped. Maybe one of the best gifts that you can give is the honesty that you're in need. So she comes, and Janie brings her to the hospital, and we spent the week in the hospital with her. A bunch of the people that are part of our missional community visited her and brought her flowers, and we prayed with her at her hospital bed and loved her, and she couldn't go anywhere this time. (laughs) 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 And, And the truth is, if she was honest, she wanted that. She was just afraid to be hurt. And so we do that because we don't think anybody will really love us. So God was really gracious in those moments, and she started to trust us. She got out of the hospital, and we said, hey, it seems like you might need help with your van. And our missional community said, well, if she was our family, we would pay for the van to get fixed because that's what family does. So let's just do that. So we offered that to her, and she said, okay, and can I borrow your van for today? I said, sure. So we gave her our van, and and so she'd drive in our van. Well, she kept doing that for months. And finally we said, we're not letting you use our van anymore. We're going to give you our keys if you give us your keys. So it was like kind of like this little exchange. Like, you want our van? Great. I want your keys. So we got her keys and we paid to have her van fixed. And it just continued to be like that. Well, what would family do at, th- at Thanksgiving? We wouldn't let her be alone. So she came with us. And at Christmas. And we celebrated her birthday. And we you know, invited her over for dinner a lot. And then we paid for some of her utility bills because she couldn't afford it. And and eventually we realized, you know, her house is going to fall apart. We asked if we could get in there, and she still hasn't, by the way, let us into her house. She's still broken. Um, But she said, I said, well, maybe you won't let us into your house. Can we at least work on your backyard? And she had blackberry bushes about as high as the ceiling covering the whole backyard, and two cars (laughs) were buried in the middle of her backyard. One was the first car that she and her husband dated in. The second was the first car they bought together, and they were a memorial to her husband. And so she wouldn't let us get rid of them, but we did clear out the whole backyard. We got, the guys loved it. We, you know, ordered, we kind of got those big, uh, like, uh, like big earth mover machines, and they're like literally like <laughs> digging up her yard, and we got permission. You know, we did just go in and do it. <laughs> and, uh, and we said, what if we could make a community garden back there? So we, we tore up all the blackberry bushes and we put gravel in the back of her yard and put the cars there so that she could keep them, even though I want to get rid of those because they're like possum-like houses right now and raccoon houses and everything else. Yeah, I know you like possum, but we have too many, just so you know. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah, and, and so, so then, then we built a community garden back there. And then I remember she'd sit in the back and watch us work on the garden and we'd eat all the food together and... Pretty soon we put a little kids' play area there because she wanted kids around, so kids playing around on, on the, the slide and all that. And So it's like all of a sudden we just said, what would we do if she were family? And, uh, and that's important to ask because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I remember um, there was a, a day when Nikki showed up and she was talking about this guy who had, she'd been dating, and he had really he just took advantage of her, basically. He was a mortgage guy. He worked at a bank, and he convinced her to reverse, do a reverse mortgage on her house. Do you know what that is? Where, like, it was paid off, and so, like, get another loan, live off from it, and eventually it'll decrease the, val- the value of your home. Basically, it becomes a retirement. The problem was is he was doing it so he could get a percentage off from it, and he wanted to live off from her money. And then at the same time, he was also taking advantage of her in other ways and really hurting her. And we warned her against him, but she just kept doing it. I felt like I was doing it with a teenage daughter, to be honest. Like, I'm like, like, she just was wanting so badly to be loved by a man. I remember the day she came over and she was talking about this guy and how he'd hurt her, and my wife and I were hanging out with her, and we were having a drink or something. And I remember I took two glasses uh, and lifted them up, and I took the one and lifted it high and said, I want to let you know, Nikki, that you've been worshiping this man. This is after she'd been telling me how much she hates him and how much he's hurt her and all that. And she said, no, I haven't. He's a jerk. I don't worship him. 
And I said, no, to worship someone is to let your life rise or fall upon that person, to build your life on them in such a way that they become the controlling center of your world. And so every time you're in a great mood, it's because he's been great to you. And every time you're in a bad mood, it's because he's been horrible to you. He really is the controlling center of your world. It's been a clear. She's like, that's disgusting. And I said, I know. He doesn't deserve worship, does he? She's like, no. I said, but I want to let you know there is a better man. And I lifted the other cup and I said, I want to let you know there is a man that is amazing. And I want to introduce you to him. First of all, he's unbelievably good looking. <laughs> this guy is glorious. And uh, she said, really, who is he? And uh, I was having fun because here's a side note. A side note. Whenever you get to talk about how Jesus is the better, it's easy to do because he is better than anything. So like I just started talking about Jesus like he was the man of her dreams because he is the man of her dreams. And I said, you know what? He's a man who will be faithful to you. He will love you day in and day out no matter what you do. He will, he will lay down his life for you. In fact, he already has. And I kept telling her more and more. She said, who is he? And I said, his name is Jesus. And she grew up in kind of a Mexican Catholic background. And she's like, oh, Jesus, yeah, I know. <laughs> and I said, no, no, you don't. You don't know how much he loves you. Because if you did, you wouldn't go to this other guy the way you are. In fact, if you got the love of Jesus, you'd be free to be able to even forgive this guy and, but not need this guy to be your God anymore. And she said, I want a man just like you, Jeff. And I said, no, you don't. And I lifted the first glass and I said, apart from Jesus, I'm this guy. I think about myself. I do things so that I can build up my world and my ego. And I use people. I said, you don't know who I was apart from Jesus. But before I knew Jesus, I was a jerk. And I took advantage of women just like he did. So I'm no different than him. The only difference is Jesus has changed me. And what you're seeing in me is not me, it's Jesus. And I lifted my glass. I said, the life that I'm living is the life that Christ is living in and through me. So if you've seen me love my wife, well, it was Jesus loving my wife through me. It's him changing me. If you've seen me be a good dad, it's because Jesus has shown me the Father, and the Father's helping me be a father to my kids. So that's what's going on. And I said, I want to encourage you. You need the same. You need Jesus to come into your life so that you can have the same thing I have. And then you will get that guy you want. And if you get that guy, then you won't need this guy anymore. But God doesn't say he doesn't want you to have a husband. He just wants you to know that he's your first husband. He's your best husband. He's the best man in your life. So I want to encourage you to come and invite him to come into your life. That's where it ended. And a few days later, she showed up and she said, to the, to talk to my wife, I wasn't home. She said, I want, to, I want to let you know I was up all night last night. And I was praying and I, I gave Jesus my life and I asked him to come in and be the man that I need and she said I know what Jeff's talking about now and uh, she said I was actually able to pray for this guy and I asked God to forgive him and to show him his love and she said I was up all night praying for all the people that have hurt me that they would know that God loves them too and Janie asked who is Jesus to you now and she said Jesus is my father I remember thinking gosh we didn't talk about the Trinity we got to clean that one up <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully the, the spirit reminded me no no what she needed more than anything was to know the love of the father through Jesus the son and if Jesus said if you've seen me you've seen the father what did she need she needed to know she was loved she was looking for love and it was destroying her life because she was engaging she was exchanging the truth of God for a lie and worshiping the created instead of the creator when the creator is the most loving of all and she needed his love and once she got that, she could start to forgive others. Now, she's not perfect in love. I'm not perfect. I mean, in some way I am because I'm in the heavenly realms perfected in love, but I'm still working that out as I'm putting to death my flesh and trying to live out this new creation reality that I am, that I'm a truly loved son, perfectly loved. So I want to encourage you. Like, can you imagine if the church, first and foremost, thought of themselves as God's loving family? And that's how we made our decisions. That's how we designed what we do. That's how we thought through every activity, every program, every event. We said, what would a family would do? How would a family love? Who has God sent us to to show the Father's heart? How will we do that? That should be how we set up what the church is and does. And if that's not the controlling identity for what the church is and does, then you're, you're actually walking away from the fundamental understanding of what it means to be God's people. A loving family. That's why elders have to be able to manage their own household because they're showing a loving family. It's why they have to be hospitable because they're showing a God who's saying, welcome in the stranger. 
Because that's what we do. We're the family of God who brings people in and treats them as though they belong. Do you know what hospitality is? Biblically, it's not being nice to Christians and having them over for dinner and doing fellowship. Biblical hospitality is inviting the one in who doesn't have a family, who doesn't have a home, who doesn't have food, who doesn't have clothes, and you treat them like they belong to your family. Do you guys see the movie Lone Survivor? Maybe you haven't. If it's, I won't give it away because it's about the lone survivor. Uh, a guy who, <laughs> there's a bunch of guys who go into, uh, I think it's Afghanistan um, during the war, and, and they get, I mean, they just get slaughtered, and one guy is left. And he finds himself injured, trying to get out. He's in the river at one point, trying to hide because people are coming. And he all of a sudden looks up, and there are some Afghanis standing there. Now, they don't have guns, or they're not soldiers. They are locals. And, uh, but he thinks he's done. But they have a policy. They have, a, they have a, 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 a conviction about hospitality, that if you find a stranger, you have to treat them as though they belonged. So they take them in at the risk of their own life, and they put them in their home, and their conviction is, at the cost of your own life, you must protect this person. That's, that's, their, that's, their, that's what they believe about hospitality in the Middle East. And so what they do is they literally risk their entire village to protect this one guy. And eventually he makes it through and he's saved. That's what the church is called to be. We're called to treat people as though they were our own, whether they're an enemy or not, and love them in such a way that their lives might be saved. That's who we are. That's biblical hospitality. So when a, an elder is called to be hospitable, they're to be the example of what the church is to be, which is to be a people who welcome in the stranger and the, the person who doesn't belong and say, you are now part of our family. Whether or not they're part of God's family or not, we don't, that's not up to us. The Spirit of God has to do that work. We still love them in such a way that they'll get to know what it's like to belong to God's household. Can you imagine if that's how church operated? That'd change a lot of what we do, wouldn't it? We tend to make most of our decisions based upon what those who, of us who already belong want instead of those who don't belong need. Let me just ask, like, think about that. Like, what are the implications that come to your mind? If we said, okay, now how are we going to do that in your own context? What needs to be undone? What needs to be redone? What needs to be put in place that doesn't exist? How, how do you think about that? How's, how's that working for you as you're processing it? What are some of the implications? Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to get rid of some things. I, I remember interacting with a church as I was trying to help them transition to being a, more of a family, and they said, man, we just don't have time during the week to make more room for unbelievers. we got enough programs we're trying to run just for our own people. It's like, maybe you need to get rid of those. What else? Maybe you have to do that in your own life, even. I, uh, one of the guys that I'm mentoring, he uh, works out of his house, and he's, they've got five kids, they're homeschooling, and, and he, uh, he said, man, I just feel like I don't know any unbelievers. I said, well, why don't you start working in a coffee shop? He said, well, if I did that, I'd have to buy coffee there. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> He's like, well, I'd have to budget for that. I'm like, it's going to cost you something to, to love people who don't know Jesus. It costs Jesus' life. Put that into your budget. It's not a lot. You know? And then he said, well, my wife needs help with the five kids. I said, you guys may need to rethink about your convictions about how you lead your kids on mission. I'm not saying you shouldn't homeschool them, but maybe, maybe that's going to change the way you order your household and what you do with your kids. Or maybe it's going to call you to ask for more help to help with your kids, because five kids is a lot. Maybe she can ask for more people to come alongside of her so you, you guys can be freed up to be more engaged in the people that we're trying to reach in the city. I had another family I was working with, and again, I'm not against homeschool, so don't hear that at all. I, I actually, I, I've often told my wife I would love it if we did that, but she doesn't really want to, so I'm not going to force something on my wife. Because she's like, I'd have to carry a lot of the brunt of that. I'm like, you are right. So, <laughs> so I don't want to be an idealist and kill my wife in the process. Um, but I was talking to a family who homeschooled, and we were having a, it was one of these trainings, and they came up to me afterwards, and they said, you know what? We built our whole life out of the fear of what people could do to influence our kids. And as a result, we wouldn't even let our kids interact with any of our neighbors. And so all of our neighbors know that we're the one family in the area that will not interact with anybody, and that's what they think of Christians. I said, so what do you think you need to do about that? They said, well, first of all, we think we need to repent and go back to God and say, God, you're a better parent than us, and we want to trust you by being obedient to what you command in your scriptures and trust that you'll take care of us as we do that. 
I said, what else? They said, we're thinking about throwing a party, inviting all our neighbors and just making it a repentance party and just telling them we're, we're very sorry that we've only been thinking about ourselves all these years. I came back to that place a couple years later and they said they did it and God was opening all kinds of doors for them to share the gospel with other people. Talk about a way to disciple your kids. That's beautiful. Not only did their parents say, see their, uh, did the kids see their parents repent, but they saw their parents lead them in being disciple makers together as a family. That's the beauty, by the way, of homeschool is you've got a lot of time to do that if you want. you just got to make it not just about you. So the church might have to do that. We might have to do it in our own budgets. We might have to rethink some of our family convictions about how we as a family open up our homes and our lives to those who don't know Jesus. What else might have to happen? Any other implications that you thought of? Yeah, we might actually have to say, do I really need to work this many hours? A lot of times when I meet with people, they're like, I just don't have time for this. I work 70, 80 hours a week. Do you have to? Well, I'll never get my promotion. Do you need it? It's amazing how much we think we're victims. We think we're enslaved. Like we're, We can't change anything. We're the, we belong to the kingdom of God. We get to change the culture around us. We don't have to be changed by it. Like, why do, we not, why do we not believe that God will help us to be obedient and faithful to what he commands? He really can. So there's probably a lot of implications. I remember even at a, a church leadership level, we were wrestling through this in terms of how you pay people in the church. And uh, we said, well, how would a family do it? Because most churches do it more like the business world does. You know, it's like tenure, education, weight of responsibility and all that. And if Back to our conversation, if you do it that way, then the church is going to think you're paying for a good and service, okay, instead of what a family would do. And so we said, well, why don't we do it like family? You know who gets the most uh, of our resources in our family? My kids. It's actually the weaker ones who get the more. You know, like, I don't go to Maggie, who's seven. Maggie, you're only in first grade. So we're not going to pay, we're not going to really take care of as many of your needs, because we're waiting until your education level gets up to a higher level. And you, know, and you don't really bring a whole lot to the household. <laughs> I mean, you're only seven, you know. So, in fact, you're kind of a bear on the household. So, you know, we don't do that. We go, uh, I go, my wife and I are going to sacrifice more discretionary income for just whatever we want. Because our kids need us to buy them new shoes a lot and new clothes a lot because they're growing like crazy and they're eating more food as they get older and, you know, and their, their school costs money and I have to buy them supplies for, for sports and for music lessons and for dance. And, I mean, the money that's going out to my kids is the largest amount of money that's going out into our household. It just goes back to them. What if we said in the church, this is what our elders decided, what if we said... Let's not pay according to tenure, education, or position. Let's pay according to real need. So one family has five kids, another has two. Seems like the one with five has more need. Let's take care of them. Oh, he doesn't need as much. He was able to buy his house in a market when the housing cost was a lot lower, but now you're buying a house and the housing market's a lot more. We need to pay you more so you can live here. Or, you know what, your kids are out of the home and they've gone through college and now they're all, they're all on their own. You don't need to make nearly as much as everybody else because it's just you and your wife. You're an empty nester, so you can pay, make less now. What if that's how we did it? And that's what we landed on. That's radically different than the world. And I'm not trying to boast. I'm just saying, like, I, shouldn't it be that you could look at the church and it should look like an alt, altogether different place? Shouldn't it look different than the world? But in so many cases, it doesn't look that much different at all. I was with a bunch of young people after a conference like this, and we were talking about the church, and they, and they said, we all know. We can see through the facade. And I said, what do you mean? They said, church is just another marketing strategy. You need to run it, so you need to make it so people will come. And then you keep them there because that's how you pay the bills. And if you keep the product strong enough, they'll keep paying. And therefore, you can keep getting the money you need to live on. And I'm telling you, that's, that the world's looking at it going, it's not any different than a business. But yes, it is. We're a family. Let's operate like one. Let's actually be family. That is one of the most distinguishing qualities of who we are as God's people in this world. And we're offering them an opportunity to get to know our Father through Jesus Christ. But we want to live like a family, okay? Yes? Just I want to backtrack a little bit in terms of... Can you help us in terms of understanding some of the other texts that might say Israel 
yeah. even the, temp the way the temple is structured or the way the tabernacle moved and then you have they kind of operated more like a war like a war movement in, in yep. battle formation yep. so how do we because say I, I desperately want our people to see the church's family but I don't want to I want to I want to do good exegesis so that we're not I'm not letting the text push me and I mean I know you know like within 1 Timothy and then there's household of God you know mm -hmm. uh, 1 Thessalonians like father mother um, but say for uh, the church in Jerusalem though it doesn't seem like it's hard to know how they operate because of its size and you know in terms of the Grecian and Hebraic widows like they seem to be operating more sort of business like can you can you help me in terms yeah. of give me some other texts yep. Don't don't um don't equate household management as opposed to familial love and expression. So what they were doing is they were doing good household management and the care for the widows. It, so in a sense there was business like activity, but it was familial in nature. You know, I mean, if you know much about people um, who have family businesses, they do business, but they their family while they do it. It's very different than treating someone merely as a customer. And uh, God hated that about Israel when they started treating people like that. Um, so he wanted, there, don't, don't, and maybe the language of using it, use, saying business is maybe a wrong way to distinguish them. Uh, but what I'm saying is don't let your work in managing the church feel less like family. That'd be my, my, my admonition. And then I would say all of God, what God did with Israel was that he wanted them to be his family in the world, to see the world blessed through them. That's the Abrahamic covenant. And I think the reason why they operated a bit like with walls was because they needed to protect the seed until the seed was born so that all the nations could be blessed. And so I think even like when we talk about some of the destructions of the nations that they came into, it's because God knew that they would destroy them and therefore the world would not be saved and humanity would not be blessed. So it's for the means of the longer term blessing that all the nations on the earth would be blessed that God had to protect his people to have the Messiah born so that he could come and do the work that all nations might be blessed through him. So I think we have to have a long view when we think about how we read Israel instead of just reading it isolated from where, where we know it's going. So like even with my, my own family, there's going to be certain things I do with my kids so that we might be a blessing to others. So I'm not going to go, hey, kids, sorry, I have no time for you. We're not going to eat together. We're not going to play together. I'm not going to pray with you. I'm not going to build you up because, I, man, I, we got to reach everybody else. Well, that's actually going to hurt everybody else because everybody else needs to see a loving family that's staying together so that they can be called into something that's worth being a part of. So there is that sense of household of faith so that it's good for all those who come into it. But if we don't do the minimum of loving one another, then we're worse than an unbeliever because we're calling them out of brokenness into brokenness instead of out of brokenness into a family that's loving. So that, that we got to remember, it's not, they're not mutually exclusive. They're necessary for both. And there's going to be household management, which feels like sometimes like business. I do a budget for my household. I do all that type of stuff. But what's driving me is not, I want to make a lot of money. What's driving me is I want to love my family well. So I'm still thinking like a family in how I manage and organize and plan and protect and care. But it's not only for us, too. It's also that others might get to experience it. Does that help? Yeah, I guess I'm just I'm trying to... I want to find other texts, say, in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, that just so that I can... First Peter, oh, you want, well, you're just looking for more evidence. So, First Peter 2, 9 through 12, you're a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, that you might declare the praise of God, of God who called you out of darkness into his glorious light. Then all the rest of the stuff Peter talks about is loving each other like family, submitting to the governing authorities, living a life that ultimately demands a gospel explanation, First Peter 3, 15. So, look at that. Living stones, you know, his whole piece is you're put in a place to be God's household amongst the nations. But I don't think he necessarily uses the language of household. But, you know, he says you're a priesthood, so you mediate to the world. Um, but chosen family is, chosen people is, is, is familiar language throughout the Bible. Because that's adoption language. To be chosen is to be adopted. So that, that's the language that anywhere you see, it's like God made a people who are not a people. Once you are not a people, now you are a people. Once you did not receive mercy, now you have received mercy. To be the people of God is to be the family of God. That's, that's all the way through the narrative of the Bible. So you've got to do biblical theology on those texts, I would say. Paul shifts to, in, in, the, in the Judeo culture, it was rabbi student. You don't ever hear any more disciple language after 
um, a certain part in the biblical narrative of the church. Why? It's because they shifted to familial language. So Paul, to, to Timothy, uh, you're my beloved son. Uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he appeals to them being children that he gave birth to. That's why he's an apostle. So I, I think it's, you have to look at the chronological movement of the description of God's people instead of getting stuck back here in rab- rabbinical language, student-teacher. Paul shifts that. Um, Jesus says, who are my family? Those who do the will of my Father who sent me. You know, was, your mother and brother are looking for you. And he responds with that answer. So I think, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to do a, have to prove it to you. I think it's very clear throughout. I mean, 1 John is all about that. I guess I'm saying yeah. you don't have to prove it. Yeah. Like, but I, I, I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing by, yeah. I don't want to try to swindle them. And um, like, yeah, I want to show them the text and yeah. say, this isn't, we're not a cult. <laughs> Sorry, that's what we're getting in our church. We're okay. transitioning our yeah. church and people are leaving us. First John, I'd go to First John. Cult, you know, you can't yeah. do this stuff. You yeah. show me. We're saying, yeah. well, you show us in the New Testament where what are we doing that is not con- that is not contrary yeah. to the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah. So I want your help. Yeah, you know? yeah absolutely. I'm your friend. I know, I know. I just, I, I actually, I, to, as I'm listening, I'm just going like, I, it's hard for me to even believe that anybody would think that we're not called to be children of God. I can't believe that. You're not a Christian if you don't believe that. I mean, you're just not. But John 1, that, that, they can, that, that, that you become children of God. It's right there in John chapter 1. John 3, born again by the Spirit. That's family language. I mean, we could just... So I'm sorry, that I'm probably like prophetically going, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I'm sorry that you're taking the brunt of it because it's like, I'm trying to feel... I, I guess I want to feel with you now. If that's real, wow, how far have we come? to walk away from that. Oh, man, I just grieve if that's the case. And I grieve with you then. Is it more that there's a gap, Stu, between what we know, uh, like what people in your church and in other churches won't necessarily disagree with that reality, but in practice, when you're saying that means we live as family, now, it really is that what it's saying? Uh, so it's more, there as we talk about the implications of it, they're pushing back maybe? Yeah, because they, yeah. they say the church is cheers. Where everyone knows your name. That's what the church is. That's family. That's family. Oh, you know, okay. I want to know everyone in this building. I see. Okay. Together. Okay. I'm, you're and helping then, me understand. And then we're big brother. We're the institution. We're going, we saw you hanging out with someone not in your mission or community. Please, <laughs> please, come, please come to the headmaster's office. You know? So that's, that's our battle. That's our journey. And so we're saying, no, 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 don't see. We want treat me as a brother, you know? And so that's what I did with our ah, my gospel, see, with, my yeah. gospel, with my gospel community. I said, at the start of this term, you know, people want to be ordered. They want to fit me into their life. They want to put me in their calendar. And so we had to, to go toward that and say, well, look, here are some things that are happening in our yeah. term together. And then this term... I was like, damn it, I'm not going to do that. And I sent a photo of us and I said, here's your plan, here's your calendar. <laughs> you know? So, but that's our journey. So, but here, here, what you're bringing up is a really good thing that needs to be identified. People, it went, one, when they hear the word family, they, re, they hear it through their grid of their experience of family. Keep that in mind. So, it needs to be reformed by how we see Jesus telling us what the family's like. That's going to be really important. Um, second, they're also hearing it through the grid of how they understand church. So now they got their family, which is broken, and their church picture, which is broken, and they're trying to mesh those two broken pieces together. That's what it sounds like. So then it's like, you know, you're up here on a platform and, you know, making sure that we do what we're supposed to do. That's a broken picture of church right there because that doesn't familial. I mean, my kids don't see me that way at all as, as a spiritual father. You know, I hope not. Um, they see me as engaging in their life and being alongside of them and struggling. And, you know, so, so we've probably got two broken pictures that both need to be redeemed, I would bet, well, as I'm listening. I, I feel like what, what happens, though, is you put 200, let's say, say for our church, 200 adults in a room, and you just let them do their thing. You get the jocks in one corner, the musos, the nerds. And so that's, <laughs> but we're trying to go in and say, no, 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 like, fam, like, Diversity, there's power in our diversity because the world cannot know. Why are you, That's John, right. hanging out with you nerd, hanging out with you muso? <laughs> but they don't want that. 
Yeah. I don't want to hang out with a nerd. You are a nerd. You, right. I'm not your friend at school. You are my. Oh, you're not even my That's enemy because right. I don't even tolerate right. you. You're scum. That's right. <laughs> so they don't see him as a brother. No, they don't. That's right. And that we need to call that what that is. So I kind of feel like it's selfishness that is driving. Yeah. People want, I want to recreate how I recreate. Yeah. I don't want to have to ask the question, right. should I make concessions for my family? I want to do what the hell I want to do. That's right. You know, and I feel that's the pushback we're right. getting. Um, people want to hang out with who they want to hang out. They don't want Big Brother making calls on their life. Mm -hmm. Well, I would encourage you to try, and try to not be the big brother making the calls in their life and more to lead them to say, like, do you, do you, have you forgotten how dearly you've been loved? Do you realize that you were the nerd in the corner and Jesus decided to be your friend? And not just your friend, but your brother. And he loves you so much. And, that, and my concern for you is that you don't know that love because the way you're expressing the fact that you don't want to go hang out with anybody but people that are like you tells me that you still think God liked you because you were like him. But he's not like you weren't like him at all, and he loved you. And so I think that's where we got to bring him back, you know, to this process of saying, because our job is to to see them conform to the image of Christ. Our goal isn't to get them to do stuff. Our goal is to get them to be who they're meant to be. That will they will do what they believe they are. That's the key. So right now you got a church that still doesn't really believe they're dearly loved by the Father. Jesus is their brother. He has, is is proud to associate with them. He's not ashamed to call them brother, but they're ashamed to call these people in their church their brothers. So they, we need to go back here at that point. That's what it sounds like. Does that make sense? And so the, the, as, as those who are preachers of the gospel, our job is to keep calling them back to Jesus and what's true for them in Christ and to help them see everywhere where they're, they're living because everything they do over here is evidencing what they believe over here. Always, always, always. Our behaviors tell us what we believe. Okay? So what I was doing with my wife was I was getting to the roots of her faith to see that she had the wrong seeds there. And Jesus says, you want new fruit from a tree, you got to have the right tree. You can't get a tree to produce uh, you know, figs if it's a, an apple tree. You need a new tree. And so we need, we, they are, but the good news about Jesus and us is that we're a new creation, so we are the new tree. But when we live in the flesh, we're living like the old tree. So we got to call them to be the new tree that they are. In that case, you're a brother dearly loved by Jesus. Do you believe that? Yes. If you believe that, how will that change how you love the brothers and sisters here in our church? Now, if they can't come up with how, then we've got to go back and keep continuing to preach the gospel, praying with them, asking the Spirit to reveal it, because what comes out here will be evidence of what they believe here. So really what you have is you have a church who really doesn't believe the gospel in terms of their, the love of God for them as a brother and a sister. That's the key. But you can reassure them anyway. That's going to be, feel a bit weird because it's sort of this... Yeah. Line drive that's a bit different. <coughs> it is, yeah. And then once it's once you try it and you you're loved better. That's right. That always wins out over a multitude of sins. Yeah, it does. And I want to encourage you to believe that actually the the life that they're gonna to get to live is way better than the life they're living right now. And we know that, but we have to believe that, otherwise we won't lead them to it. Because we'll think it's like a new legalism for them to be good people. And that's not what we want. We want them to experience life. You know, it's that what God put in front of Israel, choose this day whom you will serve. Choose life, not death. And so, all right, I'm going to keep going because you guys want to get through the other two before lunch if we can. Very good interaction. I, I'm thankful that you helped me understand because I, I was missing it. So, and I'm sorry that I was putting you on the spot. Just, yeah. That's so good. Yeah. He's <laughs> got a high tolerance to this. Yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah, I think he's okay. Yeah. But some of you guys are going to go like, I'm not going to push back because it's going to get into a public debate. And, <laughs> but we need to work that out because I, I, I was missing you on that. So. Jeff, Jeff, can I say, how, how long have you been going for? Like, how, where are you at? Because that, that's important because it takes time, doesn't it? Yeah. But it yeah. takes time for change. In terms of transitioning? Yeah, yeah. But you guys have been transitioning, haven't you? Yeah, from, so transitioned three years? Yeah, 2011. Okay. So that's a, that's a and we're an attractional church, you know, so we've... we've we had to get people through the door, you know, so we had to offer left-handed men's group who like men's deodorant, Bible study, you know, so we, we, we did it to ourselves. So now we've got to get them out of that thinking, and so we're sort of our own. You've trained up your children in the way they should go, and they're not departing from it. Yeah. <laughs> that is the real challenge. We have trained up our churches to see church as 
a catering to their desires. And that's part of our challenge. You know, can you imagine if you led your family that way? You know? We do that. Some people do that with their kids. Like, what do you want? How can I keep you happy so you won't cry? You want more candy? You want more toys? You want, I'll give you everything, just as long as you, you keep thinking Dad's awesome. Unfortunately, that's how we do our, we've led churches. It's like, we just want you to think we're great and awesome, so we'll give you whatever you want. And unfortunately, it's, been a, it's a huge disservice. It really isn't love, ultimately. It's love of self, not love of others. Love of others disciplines, and no discipline seems pleasant at the time. So the reality is, as you lead people to become more like Christ, it will be painful because they'll have to put to death the flesh. And that's what you're talking about, that disorientation of like, gosh, I'm going to be a friend of a nerd? You know, well, those of you who are nerds are like, why wouldn't you? Come on now. Uh, and, you know, it's like, but what you're doing is you're, you're doing the Peter, tell, if it's you, Jesus, tell me to step out of the boat. Okay, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm going to do this. And you do, and you start to experience the, the life of Christ being lived out and through you. That's, that's the beauty. You actually get Jesus when you obey Jesus. You get his very life lived out of your life. That, what better can it, what more could you want? And that's why you've got to keep telling them eternal life is not avoiding hell. Eternal life is that you might know him, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom he sent. If you get that, then they'll want Jesus. But if they don't get that, they just don't want to go to hell. Even if Jesus isn't in heaven, they don't care. They just don't want to go to hell. And the problem is they're going to hell if they don't want to be with Jesus. They're experiencing hell today if they don't want to be with Jesus. So we want to give them Jesus. And so part of what even you're doing is like, you've got to lead them to a place where they actually need Jesus. Well, I can't love these people apart from Jesus because there's no way I would love them apart from Jesus. So what I mean to step out is going, Jesus, I need your life right now because I can't do this without you. And now we, that's, the, that's the John 15, abide in me and I will abide in you and you'll bear much fruit. That, that's all centered right in the, between the passages on the Holy Spirit. So you want them to live a spirit-filled life? Call them to live a Jesus command obedience life because they can't do it apart from Jesus. Then they get Jesus by his spirit and they get to walk and commune with the living God. That's amazing. So when you're calling them to obedience, you're not calling them to a bad thing. You're calling them to the thing that will give them Jesus' life lived in and through them by his spirit. Spirit Spirit-filled life. That's what you get. So that's good news, right? Like that's part of the gospel. What you're going to get to is like you really get the real resurrected Jesus living his life through you. That's incredible. And those of you who know, you can experience that more and more. You're like, I can't get enough. Give me more of Jesus. So there was a hand that went up. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, and what it, is it true that um, what, you're never telling them what to do? You're just leaving them back. That's right. So you, you, you're not being a church that tells yeah. people how to live it out. You're, you're bringing them back to who is God? What has He done? Now you notice that I haven't put anything over here. Now, we're going to put something here that's going to at least guide how we might help them think through that if they're getting stuck. We'll get there at the end. But th- this is what you want to keep bringing them back to. And I'm confident the Spirit of God will lead them in how to do this. He's, he writes the law of God on their hearts. You know, we, that's the new covenant. We have to believe that we're new covenant people. Old covenant has to give everybody a to-do list. And then it becomes legalism. Don't create a new missional legalism in your church. That's just as lifeless as, as anything else we've done. We don't need that. We need a spirit-filled, empowered, Jesus-centered life that, that is led by him. So, All right. Baptized in the name of the Son. Who is the Son in, in uh, the narrative of Matthew in particular? He's the king. Okay. But what kind of king is he? He's the servant king. Okay. I love this about Jesus. He, uh, you know, the kings of the world... What do they do? They, they, they come into a place and they need, they need to have rule and reign. And, and uh, Jesus coming already has it. <laughs> but uh, they come and they need to get land in order to have a place to rule. In order to get land, they have to have armies to go and take out the other people that live there. In order to do that, they need to have money in order to pay the armies. In order to pay the armies with the money, they need to get a bunch of rich people. In order to get rich people, generally a king has to have a bunch of wise sages to at least counsel and advise them so someone is convinced they're not idiots. So they have to get wise people around them. And then once they take the land with the armies paid for by the money of the rich people that was given counsel by the wise sages, then they destroy everybody that's in the land or make them their slaves. Right? That's, that's the kingdoms of this world. And what does Jesus do? Jesus shows up and he says, says, you know what? I have what you need and instead of you have what I need. So the kings of the world go, you have what I need, i got to take it. 
Jesus shows up and says, I've got everything you need. Blessed are the poor. But they don't inherit the kingdom. I'm coming for those who don't have, not for those who have. I'm coming to give a land to you. I'm preparing a place for you. When I come back, I'll, I'll bring you to it. I, I, don't, I don't need your riches. I was rich and I became poor. So that in my poverty, you might become rich, Paul says to the Corinthian church. I don't need your wisdom. I'm the wisdom of God. But any of lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and I'll give it to him abundantly. I don't, I don't need armies. I've got angels. I could have called them to rescue me at any moment. But instead, I suffered and died so the angels would come and rescue you. Protect you. It would be your armies. It would be for you, not just to protect me. You think about Jesus when he says, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. What is he saying there? He's saying, you understand that you were the least of these and I did it for you. That's why you do it to others. You were poor and I was rich. And I became poor so that you might become rich. You were naked, clothed with my righteousness, and I would experience your shame. You were in prison, chains of sin, and I went to the cross, and I got put in the prison, and you were released at the cost of my life. You were sick with the, the death sentence of sin inside of you, the disease that was killing you, and I took it on myself, and I became sin so that it would kill me, so you could be healed. I did this to you so that you might do it to others. I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom. That's how his kingdom works. So when you're baptized in the name of the Son, you know that the king who served you has now called you to be servants unto others, just like he served you. You serve others because you were served. That's why you do it. You don't do it to get served. You do it because you were served by the king of the universe. It's amazing. And if you don't want to serve anybody, you probably don't know that you've been served. That's the problem. You don't want to give? It's because you don't think he gave you anything. When Paul is appealing to the Corinthian church to be faithful, to give like they promised they would, he doesn't appeal to some kind of legalistic task list. He says, Jesus was rich and he became poor so that in his poverty you might become rich. Now give in light of how generously he's given to you. Everything we do is a response to what's already been done. Think of it this way. Whatever God's done to you, he now wants to do through you. And we can continue to make that our mantra. Hey, what has God done to me in Christ? He's blessed me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. So what do I do? I want to bless people. What has he done to me? He's given me his own son. So what do I want to do? I'm going to give. But what has he done? He's clothed me with his righteousness. That's why I want to make sure no one is out there naked and ashamed. We want to come around and cover and bring the refuge of God around people. And so on and so forth. And so it leads the church not just love like family, but to give tangible expression of, of God's kingdom by serving others. We serve the least of these. Okay? And what's beautiful about this is that we are actually showing what it's like to be in God's kingdom as we express love through tangible serving. That's what we're doing. We're saying, you want to look at what it's going to be like to belong to God's kingdom forever, in the new heaven and new earth? The church is a foretaste of that. We're a signpost pointing forward. You ever watch the movie uh, Back to the Future 2? Yeah. You know, and Doc comes back from the future. He's like, Marty, Marty, your kids, they're a mess. <laughs> you know, and, and he gets him in the door and the thing takes off. You know, it's like it flies now. That's kind of cool. And, uh, and it flies in the future and he sees how his kids have turned out so that he can go back into the present and he can reparent his kids because the future is telling him what it's going to turn out like. Jesus is the, res the first fruit of, of the new creation. He's the only resurrected body. You guys know that, right? No one else has been resurrected yet. Just Jesus. When he appears, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now let's be clear. Dead in Christ rising first doesn't just mean they're coming out of the grace. It means they'll be given a new body. Resurrection throughout the body, or throughout the Bible, is a new physical body to dwell on a new renewed earth. That's what resurrection is. It's not going to heaven when you die. It's getting a new body to live on the new earth. That's going to be completely renewed. It doesn't end in heaven. It ends with heaven and earth becoming intersected like the garden. Where God is walking amongst humanity. That's where we're going to be at the end. And we're going to have a new body that can live forever in that state. But there's only one who has that new body. And that's Jesus right now. Now the beauty of Jesus having the new body right now. Is when he comes into you by his spirit. Which we'll get to in a bit. You actually get to have the new creation breaking into the old. That's what's happening. The spirit of God is already saying... Jesus is the first fruit of the new creation. You want to taste and see what it's going to be like? I'm going to give you Jesus, his resurrected body, in you to show the world what it's like. 
And so whatever you've done in the least least, you've done unto me. What does Jesus say? He's saying, you're walking around with me. You're serving as though it's unto me. And the world gets to taste and see how good I am every time you do it. So we're, we're like a movie trailer, you know, like, except for we're way better. Because, or worse in some ways. Because movie trailers are actually better than the movie, aren't they? Because they see the trailer, you're like, i got to see the movie. And then you see the movie and you should have just watched the trailer. Because it's all the good parts, right? The difference with us is we're a foretaste of the future reality of Christ ruling and reigning over all things. And we're just a dim picture of how great it's going to be. But we still are a picture. The church is still supposed to be the place in which you get to taste and see Christ rule and reign. And so we would ask, what does his rule and reign look like? In this place where God's sending us, where does it, where does it look like that we're not experiencing the rule and reign of Christ? Where are things broken? Where are things not restored? Where is there socioeconomic disequilibrium? Dis, dis, dis where, where are people being discarded and not valued? You even just describe it there. In the church going like, we're creating people groups that we can care for and not care for. That's not the kingdom of God at all. That's the kingdom of this world. So we want to teach them how to serve the, the nerds and the musos. And, or for the nerd, probably the nerds probably have the most to help with because they usually are the ones that are the smartest. But uh, I mean, they're ruling the world, right? I mean, look at Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and all those guys. Like, we're all loving their, their, their work. Uh, but so the kingdom of God says, how do we bring the truths of our king and his rule and reign into this place? Think about that. If you ask that question, like what, what would his rule and reign look like here in this neighborhood or this part of the city or in this part of our church? You know, like what, what would it look like if, they, if Jesus, and I know it got cheesy, what would Jesus do? I know that got cheesy, but, but here's the, the question we should ask is, what would his rule and reign look like here if he, if he were here and he is here? Does that make sense? This is us saying, we're going to figure out what it means to love one another. Here's where we're going to figure out what it means to be the hands and feet. I know that's a terrible hand. So, I, I need to learn. That looks like a foot. That's supposed to be a foot. But, uh, we're his body. We're his body so that people can see what Jesus is like in a tangible form. You do have the real body of Christ in you by his spirit. And you can live it out. You can. And he'll tell you. The spirit will guide you in that. Okay? Make sense? Okay, let's get to this last one. Then we're going to put all this together in, this, in the afternoon and how that all works. Okay, we're baptized in the name of the Spirit. What does that mean? Just, just uh, back up and think about Jesus' baptism. Okay, well, what do we know first about what, what, the, what the Spirit did to, to Jesus? Way before his baptism. He's conceived of the Holy Spirit, right? So his, his very birth into human flesh is by the power of the Spirit. What happens to us? We're born again by the Spirit. Okay? John 3. Okay? Then, then Jesus is baptized, and he comes out of the waters of baptism, and the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove in bodily form, and the Father says, This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. So the Spirit tells us we're dearly loved. Okay? Then he gets sent out to be tempted by the devil. He's filled and led by the Spirit. <coughs> filled with and led by the Spirit. Jesus. Filled with the Spirit. Luke makes certain that we don't miss that. Chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Spirit, is led by the Spirit to be tempted. He goes out to be tempted. What does he do? He overcomes like Adam and Eve didn't. And the tempter, and he, he, he overcomes temptation for us. That's amazing. Well, how does he do it? Often, people say, he quoted Scripture. And they think that's how he did it. But the problem is, the evil one was quoting Scripture. So quoting Scripture doesn't help you overcome temptation. Let's just be clear about that. You can use Scripture to tempt people. Because the evil one did that. Now Jesus knew scripture, so he knew what it meant. So when the tempter was using it, he realized, you're, you're misunderstanding all that. Because he knew what God was all about. But it wasn't just scripture, it was the spirit and the word that enabled Jesus to overcome temptation. Luke is very careful to give us a very detailed narrative on purpose. Because he wants us to realize in his second volume, the Acts of the Apostle, that, that the way that the early church overcame was through the power of the spirit and the word. So you got to have both. And so Jesus got, Jesus does not do this apart from God. He says, I can't even do it without him. That's the, the life of the human, by the way. It's the intersection of heaven and earth together. It's physical and spiritual in perfect unity. That's what Jesus is, the God-man. That's the life we're meant to live. A, a physical life filled with the Spirit. Okay, so that we'll obey. 
And then what happens next? He goes into the, the synagogue to preach. and right, He doesn't plan to preach, but they hand him the scroll. and He opens it up. It's Isaiah. He says, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. So the captives free. And he says, this is being fulfilled in your midst. And they say, they're, this, the, the, Luke says, they were amazed at his gracious words. And they say to themselves, well, is not this Joseph's son? But don't miss what they're saying. They're saying, he's been here for 30 years and he's never preached like this. What just happened to this kid? <laughs> Luke's telling us what just happened to this kid. Jesus is telling us what happened to this kid. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news. How is Jesus preaching so well? The Spirit. Is the Spirit of God on him that's empowering him to proclaim, just like the Old Testament prophets? Now Jesus has been given that kind of prophetic ability to preach with great authority and power. Now don't miss it. The very same Spirit that fell on Jesus to enable him to preach is the same Spirit that falls on the early church in Acts 2, enabling men and women, young and old, to all proclaim the mighty deeds of God in languages people can understand. That same Spirit, no different. It's not like, you know, they, went, they got the little teeny spirit and Jesus got the big spirit, you know? No, they, they got the same spirit that Jesus had. There is only one spirit. And we all have the same spirit that enabled Jesus to preach like crazy. You know, don't ever tell anybody, there's only some of you who are called to do this. If you have the spirit of God, you're all called to preach the gospel of Jesus with power and authority just like Jesus did. Now, and just to clarify, because I know some of you guys have a, when I say preach, you think of a platform and a stage on Sunday. That's not how they would have read the Bible. For them, preaching was being a herald of the good news, and everywhere you go, you're willing to talk about Jesus. That's what preaching is in the, in the New Testament. There's, there's teaching, and then it's just a little different, but everyone was sent to preach the gospel. Look at what happened when they were persecuted. The church was scattered. It says they preached the word everywhere they went. And it's talking about everybody, not just a few. Why? Because you have the Spirit. What does the Spirit do? He testifies to Jesus. He's given you the power to be His witness. Why? Because He witnesses to Jesus to you, and then He witnesses about Jesus through you. Whatever God does to you, He wants to do through you. That's how it works. The Spirit's testifying to you, so you can testify to others. That's, that's, and if the Spirit can testify to you, it's, he's, not, he's not confused about who Jesus is. So he can testify through you in ways that you won't even be able to explain. Have you ever been with somebody afterwards? They go, man, I had this conversation. It was amazing. I, I can't even reproduce it. Yeah. And they try to tell you what happened. You're like, that sounded okay, but that wasn't that, that, wasn't that impressive. <laughs> and you, what, what they can't do is they can't reproduce what the Spirit of God did in that moment when he filled them and empowered them to proclaim Jesus to a friend. And they can't even say it again because only the Spirit could say it to that person in that time in the way he did. That's an amazing life you get to live. And then, then what happens? Jesus casts out demons and he raises the dead and he does all these remarkable things. Jesus promised that we would do the same thing by his spirit. Why? Because now the, the love of God is being poured into our heart. The kingdom of God is being expressed through our hands and now we've got to tell people about it. We've got to proclaim and be witnesses to Jesus. I would say, you know, filled and led and empowered by the spirit. Just like he was, now we are sent. Jesus, remember in John 20, 21 says, As the Father sent me, so I send you. And then what does he do? He breathes on them and he says, Receive the Holy Spirit. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm sending you to be missionaries just like God sent me, empowered and filled by the Holy Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God, you're a missionary of God. You want to live a Spirit-filled life? Get on the mission of God that he gave you the Spirit to do. That's why you have the Spirit. You don't have the Spirit just so you can sit around and go, isn't it great to be a Christian? Yeah. No, you have the Spirit so you can be a witness to Christ. <laughs> Jesus says, wait for power on high so you will be my witnesses. So we love one another like family. We serve each other like the King served us. And then we proclaim Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, both with words and with signs and wonders. Well, we got to get back to believing that the Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit that empowered the early church to do all the work they did. Yeah. I remember someone asking once, why do you think we're not seeing as many miracles and signs and wonders anymore? And I know some, and maybe you're those people, and I want to respect you. Um, some will say it's because the scriptures are written and that was the job of the Holy Spirit. That's not actually what the Bible ever says. Good. So if you, you come up with that, it's not a Bible answer. That's just a, our answer. Because they didn't have in there, once the Bible is canonized, then the Spirit is done. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. Um, the reason why the Spirit was given was to accomplish the mission. To fulfill all of Jesus' words. To make Him known to our hearts. To empower us to do the very things that Jesus did. That's John 14, 15, and 16. 
That's why he's given to us, that we would be able to do the very same things Jesus did. And so oftentimes when people ask me, why do you think we're not experiencing as much of that? And I just, usually my answer is, presently I don't think the church needs it. I don't think we're living the kind of life that requires the power of the Spirit. Most of what we're doing we can pull off in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And I'm more and more convinced of that because we really have done so much that we could, that just humans could do. But I, I think if we were to start walking out into the places God has for us to do the things that God designed us to do, you would not be able to do this without God's help. And you would need Him. You would need Him to break in and break through and to do remarkable things in and through you. Last night when I was teaching on gospel fluency with some of you who were there, and, you know, I said, why are, why are we not going in and praying for the sick that they'd be healed? What, what, what a great opportunity for evangelism is to pray over sick people and see them healed and then tell them Jesus did it. You know? I don't think, well, we've lost that ministry, it seems. Well, we should get back to that, maybe. You know? But we tend to only pray for those who already know Jesus, not for those who don't know Jesus. But so much of Jesus' healing ministry was those who needed to, be, to come to know him. And then he healed them, and then they came to follow him and believe him and said, I'm going to go everywhere you want. Sometimes he told them to shut up and not tell anybody. Sometimes he told them to tell everybody. I still don't get that about Jesus, but that, you know, there were, he knew what he was doing, I guess. So. But if you think about how Jesus walked in the Spirit for the sake of mission, it wasn't just for the sake of himself. It was for the sake of accomplishing the purposes God had sent him to accomplish. So, we're a family, we're missionaries, we're servants. And I think if the church really believed this, it would change what we do. I really do. If we think about it, every member of the body of Christ knew that they were given the Spirit and they could be empowered to go and, and be a witness to Jesus everywhere God sends them. That they are missionaries 24-7. Think about how they look at their life so differently. I remember I had someone come to me. We'll take a break after this, I think, for lunch. Someone came to me after, uh, after I was teaching, and they said, how much time are you expecting from your people? Mm -hmm. I, I was like, I, I don't understand the question. And I said, well, how much time do you expect them to give to the church? And I said, I don't think you heard anything I said. Because <laughs> we don't give to the church. We are the church. So I guess I'd say... 24-7, I'm expecting. Because if they're God's people, they're His church. If they're His family of servants and missionaries, they don't stop being that ever. That's who they are. And so they're always the church. So I'm expecting them to give every single hour of every single day of their whole life to be God's people for God's purposes in whatever place He puts them. And I think the reason why we struggle with that question is because we still wrongly define church as an event. Or few hours or whatever it may be. And if we can release God's people to think of themselves as the church all the time, think of what could happen to the world. It would be amazing. I don't, I don't think that we went very far from the Reformation in terms of the priesthood of all the saints. For some reason, it just seemed like it, it got stopped. And we created a new clergy laity divide. And the, the people see the priests as the paid pastors and ministers of the gospel. And the rest of the people are just there to kind of support them or learn from them but not to be the church. And we got to get back to what God intended, and that is that he would have a kingdom of priests. That, that what that is is a kingdom where we serve the least of these, and we proclaim Jesus as the reconciling people that he meant us to be, just like 2 Corinthians tells us, just as we've been reconciled to God, now we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We're being sent out as his priest to the world. And all along the way, we look like an altogether different kind of people because God is our Father, and we live very differently than everybody else. All right? Maybe we should eat break, eat, take a break for lunch. Probably plenty to soak in a little bit. We'll talk through how we apply it all afternoon, okay?